This is Top Landing Gear. Well, Top Landing Gear is in Lincolnshire right now on the most beautiful autumnal morning. And we're at what was RAF East Kirkby and is now home to the Lincolnshire Aviation Heritage Centre. And just sitting in front of us, looking amazing, is an Avro Lancaster. And hidden away in one of the hangars is a mosquito. And next to me is Andrew Panton, who runs this fabulous museum. Andrew, very good morning to you. Just tell us a little bit about why this museum was set up and what you do here. Okay, well, it goes back to um, wartime, um, obviously, with uh, being on a wartime base, but um, one of our family members, uh, Christopher Panton, flew on Halifaxes during the Second World War on Bomber Command and was lost on the Nuremberg Raid, um, 30th, 31st of March, uh, 1944. Um, so his loss really affected the family. It was a family of um, eight children, mm. so Christopher was the oldest, or second oldest, should I say, um, and he had younger brothers, Fred and Harold. Uh, and they, during wartime, were about, I think it's about nine and 13, so quite an impressionable age. Yeah. Um, obviously looked up to their brother an awful lot. Um, he was obviously going off to war and, and fighting for the country, so yeah. it had a, a really big effect on them losing uh, Christopher. Um, Fred always um, has a story of, um, he was friends with the postboy, local postboy, used to bring out the telegrams. And, uh, of course, the postboy came up the garden path, and at that uh, point he knew yeah. that he was bringing a telegram to say that Christopher was missing. They thought it was going to have a, a big effect on their, their mother, but actually it had a bigger effect on their father. And of course, after that, he wanted no more to do with mm. anything to do with the RAF Bomber Command, anything like that. Um, but Fred and Harold wanted um, some kind of memorial to their brother, something to remember him. Um, and eventually, this is what, what sprung up from it. So um, they went, uh, or Fred went over to Germany to find where Christopher crashed and find his grave. The first time they'd been there in the, it was the 1970s. And Fred was your father? My grandfather. Your grandfather. Okay, but, oh, yeah. what, was, what was Christopher's role in the... In the he was a flight engineer. So engine management, fuel management, <coughs> um, right-hand man to the pilot, basically. Mm. Um, slightly different on a Halifax to a Lancaster in the placement on the aircraft. So uh, on a Lancaster, they're side by side, pilot and flight engineer. Um, Halifax, um, there's a Halifax cockpit in the, in the hangar there, but the flight engineer is kind of two seats behind the, the pilot. Yeah, so he obviously went through all his training and flew with 433 Squadron at Skipton on Swale in Yorkshire. Um, so Fred and Harold um, wanted some kind of memorial to him. Um, they went to see the grave and that kind of really reignited their passion for it and interest in it. Um, and not long after Fred got back from Germany, the Lancaster came up for sale at Squires Gate at Blackpool. Wow. Um, and kind of, I guess, everything happens for a reason, fate and all that. And, yeah. Um, they didn't actually manage to buy it at that time. Uh, but they kept in touch with the person who bought it. Uh, were given first refusal. In the interim period, they bought the airfield here, um, thinking that sit there's the original control tower here I stood on the, uh, the the balcony there and thought if we bring the Lancaster here, there'd be nothing else like it in the world. Wow! And so that's kind of sprouted into this. So, uh, and that is as a memorial to Christopher Banton. Yeah, to Chris and uh, all of Bomber Command as well. Yeah. Wow! And do you know what? price was paid. Yes, I, that's what I want to know. That's always I super like to ask. ask. Yeah, always a question I'm asked. It's, it's the one question I know the answer to, but yeah, uh, it's yeah. the one question I'm, I'm told we... It's, it's not, there's no point answering that one, yeah. so, oh, really? so to speak. Oh, yeah, there is an answer. Um, there is an answer, yeah. So if you yeah. were to answer it, what would you say? <laughs> <laughs> I would mumble and it wouldn't really be that. <laughs> but, but it's it, priceless. It, it, yeah. But that's it, isn't it? Yeah. No matter what, it is priceless. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the way we look at it is if we sold that one, where'd we go and get another one? Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, completely... Exactly. Yeah. That, that was the last one sold, pretty much, as well, yeah. so... Is it, uh, it, yeah. I'm just astonished. I love this Yeah. Place. yeah. I'm, I know a little bit about its history, Andrew, and I think I've actually seen it flying because I saw it at Biggin Hill mm -hmm. in 1965 when it was painted white, and I think it had yeah. just come back from France. Just kind of, yeah. Or, it was um, after what? the war, um, so it never saw wartime service. It was built for Tiger Force, so it's going to go out to uh, Japan and the, the Far East and mm -hmm. continue the war out there, obviously after the VE Day. Um, but it never actually got that far because the Americans dropped that atomic bomb, uh, finished the war. So it went into storage, and then the uh, French Naval Air Force, Laval, um, wanted some aircraft for doing maritime reconnaissance. Mm. 
um, and there was about 50 Lancasters, I think, that were sold to them. Um, so she went out, she was painted white, um, or she, originally she was painted midnight blue um, for some time and then white. Um, and she was serving out in uh, Australia and the May and all those islands out there. Um, and then the French, like everybody else, found her too expensive to use. Um, so they gave her to a um, historic restoration uh, company, Preservation Society, yeah. who planned to fly her in the UK and do um, air shows and, and flights with her. Um, they didn't know at the time that it was out in Australia when they wanted it. Oh. Um, so the French says, yeah, you can have it, but you've got to bring it back. So they had to raise all the money to bring it back to the UK. Um, so in the, I think about 64, 65, they brought it back yeah. into Biggin Hill. Yeah. And it, it stood there for a lot of the airfares. Yes. Um, you could go up the nose through the aircraft and down the, yeah. out, out the yeah. door. Yeah. Oh, so maybe I didn't see it flying, but I certainly saw you, it. You may well have seen it flying, yeah. yeah. It, um, when it came back, it had a few... Um, kind of maintenance issues to do with it so there's a propeller yeah. that was up in time so they had to get that serviced and uh, yeah. did it fly back from Australia? yeah it's flown it around the world effectively it incredible. flew all the way out to australia and then it flew all the way back incredible. yeah it's, it's one of the only aircraft that will have flown around the world yeah. and the aircraft the Lancaster. Yeah. aircraft restoration and uh, heritage back in the 60s wasn't really a b- as big a movement as it is now no nothing like there weren't really many um organizations that were doing it um it's really i guess the things like the the battle of Britain film that that really sparked people's interest in, yeah. in flying old aircraft. So yeah. um, they've got the organisation, which is Historic Aircraft Preservation Society, is the organisation that brought it back. Uh-huh. I think they had a, a sea fire. Um, and then they actually had the nose of the mosquito that's here. Oh, wow. Um, this Lancaster, of course, and a half track and, and various other little bits. Yeah. So, it seems to be that a lot of these... Uh, historic aircraft have been rescued through kind of just good luck yes someone's just yeah. decided that we're not actually going to scrap that it's not there's never been a pro an organized program that people have just on a whim said well we'll keep that one i think one of the spits yesterday was yeah. that it was yeah. sold for 25 pounds yeah. um <laughs> and you know it's 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 people like yourselves uh, benefactors or i mean it's extraordinary really that we've got as many as we've got mm. yeah it's the right place right time i mean it had, had that one saw wartime service it probably wouldn't have survived mm. It wouldn't have been taken on by the French because it's a Mark Seven, so it's oh. like the GT version of Lancaster, yeah, shall yeah, we say? Yeah, it's it's yeah. the most modded version. So. But you, know, you sort of mentioned that the, the French had twenty, or so. it was about fifty, I think. About fifty. Took, yeah. Where are the other forty-nine? Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. 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 Wouldn't it be great if the uh, the myth of the all the Spitfires in crates in Russia <laughs> proved to come true? Mm. And there's oh, yes. a load of Lancaster stuff. Well, maybe it's best that there aren't. Yeah. Maybe yeah, it's good. It depends on your viewpoint. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, uh, makes yeah. this one rarer. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Andrew, tell us what uh, we're here because for Greg's 40th birthday, the bass player of our band, we came here for a whole day, for a VIP day experience. So tell people what, what you offer. Because when Jez even walked in, he said, this is one of the best days of my life. <laughs> <laughs> and it's same here, same, same for me. It's one of the best, you know, it's an incredible experience. So tell yeah. people what they... Well, how have you... When the, original, the museum was originally set up, or when the Lancaster originally came here, the plan was just to have it in the hangar so we can go and have a look at it when we want. And it was really said, well, you can't do that. You can't deprive the nation of, of such a, a prized asset. So that's how the museum was set up, really, letting people come in and have a look and, cl- and building a collection from there. Um, our view really is that Bomber Command was made up from people of all different walks of life, all different nationalities, all from the Commonwealth, different colours, creeds, religions, everything. Um, and so what we want is the aircraft to be available to everybody still. Yeah. Um, it doesn't want to just be locked away. It doesn't want to be uh, only the elite or the wealthy can actually be involved with the aircraft. Yeah. So anybody who walks off the street can just either pay the admission fee just to come and look at it. They can yeah. have a tour on board for a little bit more, or they can pay a little bit more, and they can have a taxi ride on board the aircraft. Yeah. There's an awful lot of people that have been affected by Lancasters and Bomber Command um, and want to, to get back involved somehow. They might have had a, a family member who was a crew member, and they want to kind of experience a little bit about what their, their crew member, family member went through. So we enable people to have a taxi ride on board the aircraft. Yep. So um, they can go on board, they can take one of the crew positions, start the engines up, uh, taxi around the airfield, we do um, a quicker run where we take all four engines up to 2,000 RPM, mm. release the brakes, and we get up to probably about 30 miles an hour or something up to that region. The tail wheel um, come off the ground? We don't do tail <laughs> up. We, we can do. Um, you can officially do the tail up without it flying. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, we, we could do that, but yeah. um, our strip is is slightly shorter than you'd really desire for, yeah. for that sort of yeah. uh, the speed. But uh, yeah, but they, they they can get on board. They obviously get the smells, the atmosphere, the feeling, yeah. the, the noise of the smell engines. is a huge part of it. Isn't I it? did yeah. I did the uh, <laughs> flight engineer seat, and uh, actually 
we were with a group of some families when we came who did have some relatives and they, they got first pick quite rightly of where because they wanted to you know, maybe go where their own relatives are. Yeah. I think you took uh, that was the bomb bomb aimer. Aimer. Yeah. I, I took <laughs> engineer which is actually what I would have chosen because yeah. I thought I wanted next to the pilot it was unbelievable <laughs> yeah. and I still quite regularly watch the videos I took uh, it was incredible what sense did you get what was Power. the over yeah uh, a, 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 a quite emotional again funny the theme here with me <laughs> yes um, pride uh, I don't know sadness in a way maybe when yeah. you think about it's I think whole, looking at some of yeah. the uh, some of the buildings where you've got some of the numbers mm. uh, you know it's not directly with the rank itself but, but Bomber but, Command but, but Bomber Command the losses you yeah. know and uh, which we won't know that look at um I, over, it was overwhelming, actually. In in many, I don't think I could put one emotion to it, but it was no. incredible. And the sound, the noise of the oh, four God. Merlins, in, in, immense. Yeah. I remember when I um, went in the one at the BBMF a long time ago, uh, and you climb into this aircraft, and what crossed my mind is that that was something the last thing some people did, mm. is they climbed yeah. into this aircraft, stuck themselves down a turret, yeah. and that was it. They were never seen again. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the, the poignancy of, of that was mm. it is. We, to come and see that. we mm-hmm. have a sign at our gate. Um, obviously, RAF East Kirkby flew two squadrons during wartime, so it's 57 and 630 squadron here. Mm. They lost 848 God. men um, flying Lancasters. Oh. So we have a little sign at the gate that says, when you cross the threshold of this property, you're walking in the footsteps of some of the bravest men and women in this mm. country has mm. ever seen and will ever see. Yeah. I think that it's the last piece of Britain that a lot of people touched. It's yeah. Yeah. Gosh. Yeah, amazing, that's quite that really is. Do you, thought, ever, <laughs> isn't it? do you have to sort of remind yourselves of that, or do you get reminded every day you come to work? Because you're actually um, doing something pretty important. Y- yeah. You know, this yeah. this isn't. This may have started. It was important for you as a family, mm. but now it's actually quite important for the nation. I think. Yeah, it's. I don't know, really. It's it's not just a job. It's because it's in your heart as well. If you yeah, like, it's, yeah. it's not just you nine to five going to work and it doesn't. Unfortunately, just do nine to five hours. <laughs> yeah, sure. yeah. It's, it's, it's a life work, isn't it? Yeah, it's it a, is. It's um, and this is your calling. Say it's a calling. I this guess. is your yeah. full-time yeah. job. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, if you wanted to be a flower arranger, you never had that chance. <laughs> no, rob of that opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the best I get is to arrange some grass. That's yeah. the best. Yeah. I get. Yeah. <laughs> do you ever come here by yourself and just get in the lake? Like, <laughs> um, I've got I've got quite a young family now, so right. I've got um, a little girl that's um, six and a little boy that's four. Yeah. So. We're clo- always closed on a Sunday. Yeah. And we always get that, that one day off, that day of rest, as it always has been. Um, so we, we do quite often bring them so they can ride their bikes around and things. And that's what I did as a child. Yeah. Yeah. The museum was a lot quieter. Uh, my mum used to work here yeah. um, before I went to school, so I'd come in and ride my bike around. So it's oh, nice to yeah. be able to do that do with you, my children as well. Do you yeah. ever get in the lake? Yeah. Do you ever I mean, fire I it up? Confirm all the nice. <laughs> <laughs> but it does That's, belong to you. It is my Lancaster. Yeah. 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 Importantly, I suppose, on behalf of those aircrew from Bomber Command. Yeah, we're merely custodians. Mm. Um, although we have the, the responsibility and the, the cost of doing it, yeah. we're just looking after it for the next generation of people that are going to. Yeah. And if we don't do our job properly, then yeah. it won't be there for somebody else to look after. And so. Obviously, this year has been tough, I imagine, with, with COVID and everything. But yeah. does it normally pay for itself? Does it do? You, do yeah, it, it, it normally... Um, wipes its face shall we say yeah. and um, raises sufficient funds to then spend on to restore it to Airworthy so um, this year as you say has been incredibly difficult we're yeah. about 70% down on what we'd normally expect mm. so yeah. but and where, where are you on the on the path to flight we're three years into a 10 year plan at the moment right. so back in 2016-17 um, we paint stripped the aircraft um and surveyed everything and looked at... Uh, was that at that point that you first decided that you wanted to get it back to flight? That wasn't always the aim. It was a, a later no. ambition. Yeah, so the because it was set up by a family in memorial to their, their brother, the, the, it's kind of been done in steps. So the first thing was to get the aircraft, get it here and, and save it and, and have it as memorial. The second step was everyone kept asking when are you going to get it running? So <laughs> eventually we had... Um, an engineer just turned up on one day and said, I can get the Lancaster running for you if you want. <laughs> um, and that was a gentleman called Ian Hickling, who um, used to be on the Battle of Britain flight at Coningsby. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, and Grandad obviously thought, I bet you can't. <laughs> it, was only, it was only about, I don't know, 29, 30, so he hadn't long le- left BBMF. Um, well, all the engineers are there about, look about 12 years old anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, um, 
granddad, um, Fred, um, he um, he rang the commanding officer of uh, Battle of Britain Flight and uh, said we've had this chap turn up and uh, said he can get the lank running for us. Um, what do you think? And he says, well, if he can't, I'll kick his ass." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that, that started really getting the first engine running. He and um, someone he'd, he'd met as well, um, who was an airframe fitter on um, in the Air Force, a um, chap called uh, Roy Jarman. They came and um, they got the first engine running, number three, which runs the hydraulics and pneumatics as well. Um, and once we got one running, I'll go for a second, and then the third and the fourth. And and, and how, when were these? The, sorry, James, were these the engines that came to you mm-hmm. with? Yeah, the, the, the original engines from the aircraft, and they hadn't run for about twenty-two years. Wow! Before that point, that's impressive. Yeah, it's just a testament to Rolls-Royce engineering, really. Yeah, that is yeah. amazing, isn't it? I was going to ask, are these the engines that actually came with it? Um. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, James. <laughs> so, we, so you did say you'd answer questions twice. So there you go. So, as so first we, we're three years into a ten-year plan. Is that ten-year plan to get it flying? Yes. So we're seven years away. Yeah. Well, in theory, what we what we don't know is it's a bit of a Pandora's yes. box. What we don't know is when you you get a wing off and open it up, what else you're going to find? But um. And do the do you have to have the, sort of the CAA come up and look at <coughs> inspect every stage, like when you stripped it back to? bare metal do the 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 authority want to come and and sort of see what you've got Uh, to a certain degree um, we have an A823 CAA licensed company which is just being finalised now Um, and that's the company that that looks after the the body of work so it has licensed engineers it has all the fitters and the the engineers that do the work Um, and so quite a proportion of the responsibility is on the licensed engineer's signature yeah um, and then obviously with the backup of the, um, the company as well and um, all the human factors and training and everything like that that's involved um, and all the, the system, uh, the work packs and everything that traces everything through so you've got to be able to, to buy a nut and bolt yeah. from a supplier yeah. so and fit it to the aircraft and would you can be track it £2 in B&Q and it's £45 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. it's got a signature next to it uh. you've got to then be able to track that rivet or that bolt so all the way back to chain where it was actually yeah. Yeah. made yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah so there's that whole big system of work that goes along with just physically fitting a rivet but um, no. yeah so the CAA are involved in the fact that they will um, if they license the company they license the engineer yeah and they want to see the work packs. For us, we're, we're trying to send them every year because it's such a big aircraft, such a big body of work. They don't want it all on the desk at the end. No. We'll end the runway, ready to go. And I imagine <laughs> there's nothing else really like this going on um, that, that, that they have to deal with. There's, there's no. some, obviously, historic restoration of Spitfires and fighters and that thing. Yeah. But something on this size and this scale, yeah, th- th- you're as much in the dark as they are. If you, if you, <laughs> yeah, you know, to a degree, yeah. The, the, the closest that's happened in recent years, I guess, would be the Vulcan. Um, mm. But that's this is um, a very easy aircraft compared to the Vulcan yeah. and the systems and everything. Well, that so. kind of did for the Vulcan in the end, didn't it? The engineering, it wasn't so much it yeah. wasn't airworthy, it just couldn't be support. said to be airworthy. Yeah, they lost the, the support area yeah. and support and things. You, yeah. Is there a lot of goodwill around? I mean, are you relying on people's goodwill? And is there generally a lot of goodwill? Uh, yeah, as I, as I said before, a lot of people think an awful lot of the Lancaster. Yeah. Um, in the fact, that obviously seven man crew on board of Lancaster that's then seven families and families yeah. of the families that yeah. have had something to do with the aircraft so yeah. there's an awful lot of people where Lancaster means an awful lot to them yeah. um, and fortunately for us that also spreads into some directors of companies have got something to do with the Lancaster so the company that paint stripped the aircraft and repainted it for us in 2016 a uh, company called Mass Aviation, MAAS, give them a little plug there. Um, <laughs> MAAS. <laughs> <laughs> they um, quite a big company. They're actually in Ireland, um, the UK, Holland, um, America. Um, and they um, it's run by a chap called Tim McDougald. And his, I think it was his grandfather, flew on Lancasters. He was really? a pilot on Lancasters. Mm. Yeah. And that all came about by one of our supporters. Um, he's a a member called Armand Lloyd he, he emailed us saying there's all these gauges on eBay um, like RPM gauges and various things can I buy them for you as a donation to the museum of course we said yes <laughs> um, he bought them um, and the chap who was selling them a chap called Tim McDougall said why on earth do you want these and so he explained and got talking about what each of them do and you know, he runs a international paint company um, that paint sure, aircraft yeah. paint airliners and oh. yeah and he just snowballed from there and at fantastic. that point was she was she white? No, she was still, there was was, camouflage, but she hadn't been paint stripped since she was the gate guard at Scampton. So she'd probably got about five layers of paint on her. And of course, paint hides a multitude of sins. Yeah, of course, yeah. Earlier that year, we'd got a quote to do a paint strip and repaint from a company, and it was going to be £125,000 to do the repaint. So um, Tim's company managed to do it for 
um, basically cost, which was about twenty thousand. Wow, so, gosh, amazing! Saved us an awful lot of money. And so, what state is in at the moment? How close? I mean, if, if there wasn't the legislation and the, and the, the regulations, mm-hmm. how close is it actually to flying now? I'm, I'm sure it would take off now if you yeah. really pushed it and wanted to. Mm-hmm. What you wouldn't know is how long it would fly for. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I suppose that's quite important. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, she's built as a Lancaster, yeah, she's aerodynamic yeah. as a Lancaster is. So, yeah. um, the biggest problem with wartime aircraft, particularly British wartime aircraft, is um, the sort of river they use is magnesium alloy um, oh. in its material. Yeah. And what you find is the magnesium deteriorates over time, so the river begins oh. to powder away. So you might take off, but equally you might start losing rivets yeah. behind you. So. Yeah, I know. And Neil Farrell yesterday at BBF remarked, said, "You know, I, I am fully aware of the responsibility I have not to damage this aircraft." You know, yes. The, you, as, as you said, you can't get another one. No, you don't it, want to be the is, one that damages. It, yeah. it is yeah. unique. In terms of the the, the paint job, um, she's marked up as just Jane. Is there a history to that? A reason for that? Yeah, um, it's quite an interesting one actually. Um, Fred, my grandfather, um, obviously during wartime, um, went to see at um, the Skegness Theatre just after the war and see a character called Just Jane. There was a lady called Christabel Leighton Porter. Who, I've interviewed her. Uh, very good, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. So yes. she, she modelled as Just bridge. Jane for, I think it was the Mirror or the Yes, Express, I think area. it was, yeah. Um, and she was quite a famous. Uh, cartoon character during the war obviously cartoon strips and things went out to the troops and things like that Yeah. Um, and she did some theatre shows after the war um, to which Grandad obviously went to out, go and have a look at and obviously it stuck with him for whatever reason I think she, probably <laughs> um, she was a bit of a looker wasn't she she <laughs> yeah, had uh, um, everything going for her he actually called his daughter Jane oh. um, and then uh, once we got the Lancaster and moved it here there was um, a big national newspaper that decided to do a story about female um, RAF members then being able to become air crew yeah. um, and they did a big front page spread on it and they wanted to put um, a pin up nose art on an aircraft and they approached us to see if they could do it on ours ah. and they picked just Jane oh how um, fabulous and so it stayed because of Fred's daughter being Jane ah, and it amazing. just became known as just Jane yeah. oh that's it has swapped sides great so <laughs> oh, okay. it, it was on the starboard side and we put it back on the port I wish yeah. it had been but uh, yeah and that's Christabel Leighton Porter. Mm. We've oh. actually got one of her dresses in the naffy here that she used for her shows. Yeah. Oh, how fabulous. I met her at Pegasus Bridge on the 50th anniversary of uh, D-Day oh, right. doing a programme for the BBC. And she was my guest for almost an entire day. Mm. And she was absolutely wonderful. Yeah. What a shame she's not around here now mm. to, to see this. That yes, yeah. She did visit us, thankfully. Did and she? The, oh, yeah, good. When, when it was originally painted on, the nose art, it, she had a, a red swimsuit, full swimsuit. Yeah. Um, but when she came, she said, I never wore a swimsuit. I was always in a bikini. <laughs> it was a, a white bikini with black polka dots. <laughs> yeah, so well, of course, I can we had confirm to then change it. Yeah. <laughs> we had to change it, so we, we've uh, repainted How it. How old was you oh. when you interviewed her? I'm not sure. Was she in a bikini? <laughs> no, she wasn't. <laughs> 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 Andrew, uh, when it comes to the, uh, I, I'll say DPM paint, because I can't think of it, the, the, the camouflage. Pattern, camouflage, thank you, paint. <laughs> how, how is that, is that a pattern that you came up with? How is that? I've always wondered this. Yeah. Because every, every aircraft is unique, I'm assuming, and, and obviously, technically, is a, there is a, you know, I know that the Royal Aircraft Establishment of Farnborough had a particular, you know, they, yeah. they, they technically specified how aircraft, mm. so on this aircraft, did you... It's Follow in the av- a guide? Yeah, it's in the average drawings. So um, okay. the drawing pack that we, we still have, there's probably about 50,000 drawings left for a Lancaster. Um, one of those drawings that still survives is the, the camouflage pattern that you're supposed to do and exactly where you put the roundels on the aircraft oh, and the, really? the fin flashings and everything, yeah. I'm in Air Force. Yeah. Is that okay? So, so they count guests yesterday. yesterday. Yeah. 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 There he goes. Um, so, but they were all different, were they? Or were they? They should be all the same. They should be all the in same. In theory, I didn't yeah. Realize that. yeah. I they there, were... there are, as as you get with an airfix kit, there are probably three different patterns you could do depending on the age of the aircraft. But, uh, oh, fascinating. Because of my airfix kits, the, the cockpit's always covered in glue and you can't see out. Is that a problem? With this? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm just building a, uh, a typhoon with my son. Well, I'm building it now. One of these typhoons? No, a, a hawker typhoon. And um, it's so small, we just forced the pilot in in the end and just painted it back. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. That's a... Uh, That's three. 
we expecting three more? Is that a challenge three? I mean, it's about all they've got, isn't it? It's about all they've got, isn't it? Actually, we were rather buoyed to hear that they got about 140 well, in the country. Yeah, really? About 140, yeah. yeah. That's See, great. I love, I love the looking at the typhoons just flying over and behind us, <laughs> the Lancaster. Yes. It's a, it's an extraordinary. So, you know, when it flies yeah. in seven years, are you going to be doing flights for the public, or is it going to be display? Or um, I can't say for definite, but the approach the CAA have had is uh, everything you do now do with a view to being able to take passengers. Amazing. And they. The CAA have something called SSA and C, which allows you to take a passenger flight in a Spitfire, Twin Six Spitfire, yeah. for example. And it's organised in weight categories. So they've currently got the weight category for something like a Harvard Spitfire, something around that sort of weight category. And they've just introduced a, a heavier one for you know, something like Blenheim, yeah. uh, Dakota, something like that. And they're now looking at a higher weight category for something like B-17 Lancaster. Gosh. Sort of, uh, so that is the plan then. That's Where do we put our nice, names? Yeah. We put our names down now. If the we waiting don't want list... to go to Canada, yeah. no. although we'd actually love to go to Canada <laughs> <laughs> to do to do that. And would you? Is that? Would you? Do you talk to the Canadians? Do you talk to the BBMF? You mm. know. Yeah, we've you, got very you, good dialogue with both. Yeah. Um, well, there's, there's lots of groups out in Canada actually that are looking after Lancasters, and we we speak to the majority of them. Oh um, really? And then we're in very good dialogue with BBMF as well. Do you know of any? Throw, so. Of course, yeah. Do you know of any others that are looking to ret- return to flight? Is, uh, is that no, a there's, there's, none? there's two that fly. Obviously, the, the yeah. BBMF and um, Canadian Warplane Heritage in Canada. Yeah. And there's ourselves who can make this one airworthy, and then there's one other um, Lancaster in Canada that currently taxis or can oh, taxi, but only oh, a short okay. distance because of the room they have, and that's at Nanton in Alberta. Right. Um, and then there's another couple that are being restored. Um, there's one at Windsor, um, which is being restored to static, uh, good static condition. So it, it's owned by the city. So they're restoring it to, in, with airworthy principles, effectively. But the city won't fly it, so right. um, it, w- it would never fly. When you, hopefully, when you do get to the stage of flying, do you have enough room here to to take off and land? Yeah, we'd need five and a half thousand feet. Mm-hmm. So. We're quite fortunate. We don't own the whole airfield. We yeah. own the, the bit we're on here. Yeah. And then the na- neighbouring landowner owns where the original runways were. Yeah. So although those runways were taken up and are currently under the A1 as hardcore, <laughs> um, the, you, we, there is enough length to put a grass strip beside the main runway. Oh, yeah, so we can get 6,000 feet of grass strip. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. More goodwill. Yeah. Yes, that's yeah. it, yeah. 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 So, so, And what's your involvement, Andrew? Obviously, as your grandfather. Uh, do, do you fly... Are you an engineer? Because you're obviously so passionate about it. How, where yeah. did it all come from? Um, well, I joined uh, the museum straight from doing A-levels at school. Yeah. So um, I'm not qualified in anything, effectively. <laughs> <laughs> I think but, none of us are. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm a, a bit of a, a jack of all trades, I guess. Some would say master of none. I <laughs> tend to leave that out if I could. Um, but uh, yeah, so I've, I've grown up with it. I've, I've gone from car parking and, and pot washing clearing tables all the way through so um, I'm now general manager of the museum um, and I also taxi the Lancaster and the Mosquito do you? do you? amazing well I mean why wouldn't you? (laughs) (laughs) if it's your museum because I can you're definitely here on a Sunday isn't it? yeah Yeah, kids that's just going out are your your kids showing uh, that is amazing are your kids showing signs of it because I mean if my Dad, God bless him, was still alive and he was doing this. I'd be yeah, every minute of the day. Yeah. Or do they? It's kind of well, yeah. We got Lancaster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't, they don't I don't, know any different. Do they they, they so. don't understand yeah. yet. Yeah. No. Um, my my little boy, who's four. Fortunately, he's very interested in airplanes and cars and things. Yeah. So yeah. hopefully that carries on. Yeah. I've never forced either of them into no. to joining it because they've they've got to want to. Though, so. Yeah. So, you, so you tax it? Are you going to learn to fly it? Um, I would hope so, yeah. In, in theory, because it's um, an aircraft on a, a permit, multi-engine aircraft, you don't need a commercial licence. Right. So you need your PPL, uh, conversion to tail drag, a conversion to multi-engine, yep. and then you, you effectively fly Lancaster, yeah. Goodness me. Do you, do you sort of dream of the day when you may be <laughs> flying down the... The mail with VVMF, <laughs> no. the Red Arrows, the Spitfire. That is a step Arrogan, ahead, isn't and, it? And your aircraft is, mm, you know, it's quite a thought, isn't it? it, <laughs> it is. I mean, it, it must be a dream to to think mm. of that. But like, why? I, I should like to be able to just jump to that point. So there's a lot of hardship <laughs> yeah, in between. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah, but it, yeah, that must be. I know it's maybe not where you started with this. Yeah. Um, but that must be. 
kind of where you're aiming, I guess. Yeah. Well, it's we we've always said that I say always said in the, the recent years we've said we want to get to airworthy. Mm. Um, now to be pronounced airworthy, she has to have done a test flight and she has to fly. So yeah. what we don't know, of course, is what's going to happen in the next seven years with insurance and our no. gas and yeah. a whole multitude of things yeah. that could go yeah. wrong in the yeah. meantime. Yeah, yeah. But, but, um, the, but there is a chance we could have three Lancasters if the Canadian one were kind enough to visit again mm. in, in the air at the same time. And isn't it extraordinary that the, the next aircraft out of the stable, the Vulcan? It's no longer flying. Yet we yeah. could have three Lancasters flying from 1943 yeah. heritage, vintage. Yeah, we're quite fortunate that um, with things like the Battle of Britain film and the, the upsurge of interest in Spitfires and getting them flying mm. in the 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, with that has come um, a good backup and support for Merlin engines. So there's, mm. there's two companies in the UK that restore Merlins, make them yeah. overhaul them to Airworthy. Um, and there were quite a few parts that were bought up after the war as well. Um, so they're still still using those and there's new parts now starting to be made so without the the ongoing support of uh, industry kind of yeah. working on engines and, and airframes and things we wouldn't be able to do this so no. can any Vulcan, of course hasn't really had that no that's true can any mark of merlin go in here or is it a very specific merlin engine for the lancaster <clears throat> so or if you're looking at, at what will fit yeah there's a, a range of engine that fits and it's the, the shorter merlin because what happened with the Merlin production and, and progression uh, through the years is you got more and more powerful. Yeah. And to do that, they changed the wheel case and the supercharger that fits at the end, basically. Um, so that makes the engine longer. So that's why you see between a baby Spitfire Mark One, the nose is short, yeah. but a Griffin or late Merlin, it's, it's very long. Yeah. So um, we, we would take a short Merlin in this, so um, Merlin 20, 24, 25, 35 would fit in. Um, whereas some of the, the later 70s region series and things yeah. would be too long. So. And could you mix up those 20s, 25s, 35s? Uh, just to physically fit or taxi, yes you could. Yeah. Um, for, for airworthy, for flight, you have to fit the correct mark for how the aircraft was produced. Okay. Or have a mod for why you're changing. Yeah. You can't drastically change the power of yeah. the aircraft. And you say this is a Mark 7? Yeah. I wasn't even aware there were that many marks of Lancaster, actually. It jumps around a little bit. Do, oh, does yes. it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So... What would distinguish this as a, as a Mark 7? So Mark 7s uh, were built um, for Tiger Force, effectively. Um, so they're tropicalised. Mm. So the on a, an early Mark Lancaster, the radiator in, underneath the engine that sits just under the prop, um, under the spinner, is um, well, two-thirds coolant radiator, one-third all radiator. So there's only a, a single unit, if you like, um, whereas the tropicalised versions had two separates, so 100% coolant radiator and then behind it was the oil radiator um, it's got Merlin 24 engines so the upgraded more powerful engines that were used for the uh, the lengths that drop tall boy and grand slam and things um, and the uh, mid of a turret is slightly different so earlier lengths had a, a Fraser Nash um, FM 150 mid of a turret whereas uh, Mark 7s and 10s had the, the Martin the American built uh, mid of a turret it's electrical turret so it's heavier so it sits about 7 feet further forward um, and it's a slightly it's quite a turret as well but it's got 50 calibers in rather than 303 so it's got a lot, a lot better firepower oh, right. okay. uh, and then it's, it goes on um, the, <laughs> uh, the tail turret on a Mark 7 is an FN82 so it's got 2.5 Brownings uh, rather than the 4 303s although at the moment our FN82 is out for restoration so we've got an FN121 fitted which is a 4 nice. don't you think so. if you own it you should know a bit more about it <laughs> <laughs> What we I find is people stop we, listening. It's yeah. not very good for a podcast, is it? <laughs> we did actually catch uh, uh, Faz out yesterday on a couple of questions. Yeah. Didn't we? <laughs> One question I did ask him, which I, I didn't want to ask him, but I thought I, thought I had to, was how long is this aircraft going to keep flying for? And the great answer he, go, he, he gave us was, the view is it's in perpetuity. Mm. There is no reason for it not to keep flying. We, you know, there is no end date. Yeah, they have a, a rolling 30-year. Yeah. That's incredible. Yes, it is. Yeah. It could be a hundred years old. Mm. Yeah, and still flying. Yeah, well, it's not far off. That's not far <laughs> off. <laughs> um, this isn't the only aircraft here. You have a Mosquito as well, I think. Yep, the Havilland Mosquito NF2, so a night fighter variant. Yeah. And how, how did that happen? Um, well. Uh, because just doing a Lancaster, like, <laughs> how yeah. can we make we need something else? Any- <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't got enough on it, we can stop busy. I'll yeah. oh, second that, Lank. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the Mosquito is um, it's an amazing story, actually. It's not owned by the centre, it's owned by uh, a gentleman called Tony Agar, right. and it's been his project for 45 years. So it doesn't bode well for our 10 year project. <laughs> <laughs> he, he hasn't um, got a museum. <laughs> yeah. 
he um it's probably his day actually i'll probably oh, introduce you I but um it. he he bought parts of aircraft so the the cockpit section of hj 711 um was at the same sale as our lancaster at blackpool Gosh. Um, so they kind of were there at the Batpool part and they've come back together again. Um, and he's he's bought up parts of aircraft and brought them all together effectively. So there's a cockpit section off one aircraft. The rear fuselage section came from one of the aircraft in the 633 Squadron uh, film. Gosh. Um, the wings are from another aircraft. In fact, we believe the wing flew from here post-war from East Kirkby. Oh, amazing. Wow. Really? Wingtips from another one. Yeah, so... And he, he's basically just gone around the world finding mosquito parts, bringing them all together, and, and has, has restored HJ-711. So the there's a, a mosquito night fighter squadron based here, or a mosquito squadron? A mosquito squadron. They they moved here from RAF yeah. Coningsby after oh. the war um, because they were resurfacing Coningsby's runway. So they are probably... On B 35s or something, some bomber squadron, I think. Um, so it had flown from here and then it moved back to Coningsby. Okay. And is the plan to get that airworthy as well? No, that one will never fly. The the problem with um, the ship. wooden structures <laughs> is yeah, the, the wooden structures is the wood over time deteriorates, the glue deteriorates. So yeah. um, in order to make it airworthy, you'd have to completely replace the entire wooden wing and uh, fuselage. Right. And Tony's view is if he does that, it completely loses the history of the yes. aircraft. Yeah. 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 It's, that's a real balance with everything you do i'm sure is is maintaining that as you say the the historic value of the aircraft yeah it's a difficult balance because people's general viewpoint is an aircraft that saw wartime service and survives now if it's not been touched is how it came off the production line but mm. in reality that aircraft it's probably got a different engine to what it was originally built yeah. with. It's yeah. probably got different rudder, different ailerons, yeah. and various things if it's damaged during wartime. So in reality, it's not the same aircraft that came off the production. No. It's not the original uh, aircraft. It's like no. we have, it, no? When I was in the Air Force, we had um, helicopters that were originally built in 1978 and 79 that are still flying. But it's a bit like the trigger's broom thing. Yeah. It's had a yeah. new head and three new handles. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the, the name is still the same. Yeah. And, but the, there is a, obviously a thing with particularly Spitfires, as long as you've got the nameplate, yes. you can build a new aircraft around that nameplate and it's an original aircraft, yeah. Yeah. Um, which it isn't. But, no. uh, but there again, in the wartime, if it needed a new wing, it would have got a new wing. And yeah. it would still be the same. So, it, it, and then do you call it a, a replica or yeah, a restoration? Where, where does the identity? Where, yeah. What owns the identity? What part of the aircraft? Mm. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> so, <laughs> maybe it doesn't really matter. Ah, maybe it's hello. in the eye of the beholder. Yeah. yeah. Than, I'm sure there might be some purists, but maybe they'd be wrong. Because, mm. well, the, the thing is. <laughs> You, you could restore an aircraft that was a wartime aircraft, so it came off the production line as a Mark V Spitfire, for example. Over its life, it's had a new wing, it's had a new tailplane, it's had a new... And when you come to restore it now, the only thing you can save is, I don't know, some skins off the wing and the, yeah. and the rudder, yeah. for example. But they might not have been the originals that the aircraft was built with. <laughs> anyway, yeah. So how much of the original aircraft have you It's a meaningless I mean, the only way that an aircraft is going to survive for 80 years is to have been worked on and repaired. Mm. Yeah. Mm. As soon as that skin is fit to the aircraft, is it actually the aircraft's identity now? Or no. you just uh, talk about quill otherwise, isn't it? It's not just something I would dwell on. No, I don't. don't I, think worry. I, just, no. <laughs> <laughs> I just I I just have the joy that this thing's sitting behind me <laughs> is there at all. So Yeah. Yeah. You ha and you have the Lancaster and you have the Mosquito. But even if you didn't have them, I would still come here. Because, <laughs> it, because it's it, the museum is incredible. What yeah. what have you got for people to see? Well it's so it's set up on the old airfield of RAF East Kirkby. Are these the original buildings? Uh, some of them, yeah. So the hangar is a new one that we put up because it was taken down post-war. But yep. the concrete pan is the original pan that it was on. Right. The concrete we're sat on now is uh, original. Um, the building behind us is the NAFI building, and that's an original building from RAF Manby right. that was taken down and brought here and put back up here. So it's not in its original position, but it's an original building. Um, the building to our right here, the fire station as it was, um, is a, an American building put up in the 1950s when the Americans operated from here. Ah. The Nissan huts over there are all original Nissan huts brought from other neighbouring airfields and put up here. Control tower is obviously original to here and as it was. Toilet blocks are original. Yeah. <laughs> um, they've been worked on since. Not, 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 still not a bucket. Yeah. They've been cleaned. <laughs> yes, yeah. So they've been restored. They're not replicas. Yeah. 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 Um, we've got an escape museum, which is an original building in a slightly different position. Um, and then there's a building over the back, which was the, the engine shed originally. Yep. So it, it was it had a big pit in it where the um, the lorries drove in. So the, the bed of the lorry was level with the floor and oh. the engines were taken off there. Oh. Um, 
and there's a little little building here which is the incendiary store so that's where all the little flares were kept yeah. for the aircraft yeah so it's it's all set up on a, a wartime airfield using as many of the wartime buildings as we can yeah. so the control tower is set up as it was during wartime yeah. um, a lot of the other original buildings hold displays about various sections and parts of bomber yeah. command so yeah. the escape museum is all about um air crew uh, bailing out or ditching yeah. in enemy territory and then using the escape routes in France and um, Holland to come back to the UK yeah. it's yeah. a really interesting part of the war that people don't really think about no so, gosh because yeah. we when we did the, the taxi run I don't think I only saw about half of the museum and it, yeah. you, but I, I think it's such a unique place because it's a fascinating museum and at the same time if you come on a certain day you can watch you can just pay your normal entry and watch the Lancaster taxi. Yeah, it's, it's not working it's yet. It's, 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 it's a working yeah. a living museum. Yeah. But I mean, I think th- th- these old airfield buildings, to me, are as important as the aircraft themselves. Yeah, absolutely. Pretty much, because there's not much of this infrastructure around anymore. And no. I think to get a real feel, a real sense of what these airfields were like, something like this is is gold dust. Yeah, the, the, a lot of the airfields went back to agriculture after the war. So yeah. obviously before the war, it was a farmer's field uh, and it was just taken by the air ministry um, to build an airfield. Um, and obviously the farmer was paid a bit for it and uh, told to get off. Um, <laughs> I think the, the farmer who owned a lot of the airfield here um, had about a day to leave. Gosh. To, to take his belongings and go somewhere else. Goodness yeah. me. There's, a, there's yeah. a map in your gift shop of... Bomber Command air, for, uh, air, air bases during the Second World War, and it is incredible. Everything from almost the Thames, I suppose, from Essex up to Yorkshire, North yeah. Yorkshire. There were airfields about you know twenty airfields per, per square meter. You know, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's ridiculous. And I remember that someone telling me that the um, a lot of the training circuits actually used to inter interweave mm. with each other, and there were even collisions yeah. where aircraft uh, not speaking to each other from different bases. Absolutely, were, uh, yeah. In, in Lincolnshire, the, there's just over 50 Bomber Command airfields during the war. Um, they're usually about five or six miles apart. So there's East Kirkby here, there's Coningsby, there's Spilsby, there's Strubby, um, and all of them, obviously, when a, a Lancaster takes off to gain height, it circles the airfield in a circuit, gaining height each time it goes round. So East Kirkby's, for example, would go clockwise, Coningsby's would go anti-clockwise, oh. so they're, they're meeting head-on so they can see each other. Oh, so, really? Yeah, they'd all gain height and then go... Well, that's what they should. They, they should normally just get yeah. high. And go, um, <laughs> yeah, because I mean, fun. forming up huge squadrons of, I mean, literally hundreds of aircraft. Yeah, would it be? I mean, that's a massive undertaking. Mm. If, you, if you think each airfield, if it's a, a maximum effort raid, for example, each airfield could be putting up, I don't know, forty Lancasters, yeah. or something like that. So they've got the whole infrastructure of fueling them up, bombing them up, make sure you've got all the fuel here, all the communications, all the briefings of the crews all the, the ground crew, the WAFs. There's about 2,000, 2,500 personnel at East Kirkby. Can you imagine what it did for that little village of East Kirkby, yeah. getting that yeah. huge infrastructure, yeah. Do, do you have a complete history of East Kirkby's life during the war? Pretty much, yeah. Like, there was every a sortie that was flowing? Yeah, yeah we, we've got the ORBs, so we've got the operational record books, which list each day there was an activity, what the who the crews were, what aircraft flew, what the bomb load was. And then we've also got the station records for the airfield, which says less about the operational, more about just the general running of the airfield. Um, And then there was um, a book written by um, a flight engineer veteran who flew from East Kirkby, all about East Kirkby, and it's called Silk Sheen, which is the call sign for East Kirkby Mm -hmm. Airfield. So he wrote about um, how it was all set up and um, some of the activities and things that happened here. One one aircraft dropped a cookie when it was being loaded up, which destroyed about six Lancasters. And um, there was a farmer in a field on Keel Hill, which is a few miles away. he just left his tractor and gone for his lunch, came back, and there was a piece of shrapnel embedded in the mudguard of the tractor and things (laughs) like that. Yeah, and um, that, that bomb actually... One of the, the hangars here was um, having um, incendiaries stored in it rather than, than aircraft. And the, the first blast lit the incendiaries, and the story goes that the second blast blew them out. <laughs> <laughs> really? yeah. um, was it attacked during the Second World War? It was, yeah. The, the Germans launched things called intruder raids. Mm-hmm. So they, they would send up a, a fighter which would effectively follow the Lancasters back and shoot them, shoot them up while they were landing. Right. So East Kirby was attacked several times like that. There was also, they were also attract, attacked during daytime, um, and a couple of WAFs lost their life um, in the uh, MT sections where the vehicles were. Um, so yeah, it, it did get attacked, um, and we've also got the um, 
the windsock pole we have here is from RF Spilsby, and that's got a 20 millimeter cannon shell straight oh, through yes, the, the windsock pole. Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking yeah. of that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's when Spilsby was attacked. Yeah. God. And just going back to the, the forming up, which I, I think sounds absolutely staggering. The the Lancaster ostensibly became a night bomber, so, mm-hmm. so they couldn't have done that at night, could they? Or they did didn't. They? No, they didn't form up into formations. No. So they gained their height. So say they had to, to fly out at eighteen thousand feet. They gained the height over East Kirkby and then set set course at eighteen thousand feet. Right. Um, but Christopher, my great uncle's pilot, he decided he didn't want to do that. He wanted to save his fuel. So he made sure when they moved to the, the new airfield at Skipton Swale, he made sure he had his um, dispersal point where the aircraft sat closest to the end of the runway. So when he started, so we just taxied out to the end of the runway and went. So right. he saved fuel there. And rather than gaining height over the airfield, he yeah. would gain height on the way. So he had more fuel. Um, and the, the story goes that I think they were, were they bombing Berlin. And he had so much fuel left, he decided to go and buzz Hamburg as well. <laughs> so he went over and then came. But that, well, that to me seems quite logical to gain height on it the does there. Robert. Yeah. was there a reason why they wouldn't do that um i don't actually know to be honest i guess it's it's so everybody has got a set height as they're yeah. going out and there's there's less incident of um damage and accidents and things mm. perhaps well, was christopher doing this against orders i mean was he just doing his own thing the, Regardless. The, yes, the pilot was um a pilot called nielsen Sorry, he was, was a pilot, uh, yes. he was a dane who um his family moved to America, and he, so he was an American, effectively. He joined the Royal Canadian Air Force to then come and join the war effort. Yeah. So and, he was quite um, confused by this thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, um, he was written up in... Um, the Canadians had a magazine during wartime, and he was written up in there, and he was called the Mad Dane. <laughs> and um, it's the, the several, last thing several you want stories. Your pilot. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Great. Or, lu- or lucky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the several stories that go about him... Um, from Skipton on Swale, there's um, a very large um, hill bank um, just off the end of the runway, like in the line of the runway, yeah. called Sutton Bank. And um, they were taking off one day, I think it was on a just a circus and bumps or something, some kind of daytime exercise. Um, and they were struggling to gain height, um, and the undercarriage um, wouldn't wouldn't climb, wouldn't um, pick up. I was an engine failure or something. Um, and so Chris, as their manual hand pump, Chris had as a flight engineer had to go and pump the undercarriage up, which is several thousand pumps for this oh. pump. And they just got it up in time to gain enough height um, to go over Southern Bank. Oof. And um, Nielsen was, was heard to say, it's OK, G, because I've got it. And he was pulling it up. <laughs> so, yeah, he's a, quite the character. And he, Nielsen survived the war out of... I think they had eight crew members on that night, so they, were, they had a, what they call a dicky pilot. So each pilot of a crew had to go on a, a training sortie with a, on a proper nighttime operation with another crew member to gain experience. So he was then always more experienced than the rest of his crew to be the captain of the crew. So they had a dicky pilot on that night, eight crew members, and he would basically just sit, stand behind the pilot, see what was going on, gain some experience. Um, so the aircraft was um, attacked by a night fighter using Schrager music, which is an upward firing cannon yes. in the aircraft. Mm-hmm. Um, and... Uh, Sneaky, yeah. yeah. No, it's not against the rule. Not against well, with the rules. <laughs> yeah, not, 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 not fair. Um, yeah, so they were shot down, and um, some bailed out. The um, the wireless operator managed to get out. Uh, the rear gunner got out. He rotated his turret, went out backwards. Um, wireless operator was in the hatch bailing out, and Chris was next. And he doesn't understand how he didn't get out. And um, the pilot, the aircraft blew up in the in the air, and the pilot was blown out. So he, he doesn't know how he got out. He, he blew out and his, obviously his parachute snagged or something and his parachute came out. He Goodness. landed in a uh, churchyard. A bit ominous, I guess. But yeah. He, uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah, and um, none of them managed to evade capture. They all got captured. Um, uh, held up in um, a jail in Bamberg, I think it was originally. Um, which is, uh, we, we went over there a few years ago with Fred when he was still alive. Story and it took us out. And we went to see all the the original cemetery where they were buried, the local village cemetery they buried before they went to the Commonwealth War Graves Cemetery. And apparently, um, all the villagers they actually had a service there. Um, they, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't have been allowed to have had a service by the German army or Luftwaffe or whomever. Yeah. But um, yeah, they had a little service there for them when they interred them in the, the graves. And, Gosh. and who was Chris was identified? Was he? The, 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 the no, the. Obviously, they, they went down with, with the aircraft, so they're, they're in a, I think it's about a three joint grave. So they, they know there's three, but they yeah. obviously don't know. How, how old was he? He was um, 19. Oh. Yeah. 
He'd done 20, I think it was 27 ops he'd done. Goodness. Yeah, so he was coming towards the God, end. Yeah. 30 was the... Yeah. At the 27 at 19. Yeah. I would say, it's, I would think it's not the first operation, which is the the one you've got to be brave for because you don't know what you're going to. It's the last. It's, it's, but all the others after that, <laughs> when you've, yeah. you've experienced everything, yeah. you know exactly what you're going to go through. Yes. Yeah. Well, they, they went through some, a lot of different ops. They did Berlin, they did uh, mining operations, so dropping sea mines. That only classed as half an operation, though, so you had to do two of those because they were less dangerous to, to class a full operation. Um, yeah, they did. So they went through the, the Battle of Berlin and Nuremberg several times. They went to Nuremberg, Berlin a few times. Yeah. Some, and they, they, they credited with shooting down a, an enemy aircraft oh, wow. as a, um, a report for that. Yeah. yeah. Their, their mid-upper gunner was, originally he was an American, who called Wells. And the Americans only had to do 25 ops before you got to go home. Right. So he did his 25 and left. So they got a different, oh different middle of a gunner. So he, he missed being shot down. Oh, Jesus. That's extraordinary. Well, thank you so much for having us here. Yeah. Th- there is Very other welcome. ways which people can support if they can't come to Lincoln, because I'm a member of the Rivet Club. I see, yeah, I see. Uh, join what, what do you get in the Rivet Club? <laughs> so the, you should know. Enjoy. Yeah, you should. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Rivet Club is something we set up to help support the restoration of the Lancaster. Yeah. So... Each winter, we do six months of winter restoration work, six months of summer taxiing, effectively. Um, and over winter, you get a weekly report that tells you everything we've been doing to restore the aircraft, all the problems we've had, what the progress has been that week. Yep. And over the summer, it's a monthly one, you know, because obviously there's less restoration work being done. Um, and that can range, you, you can join up from £2 a month through to, well, anything you want, I think, about yeah. £50 a month. Is what a, buys a you a rivet? Or buys you a rivet. Um, <laughs> can you have your rivet put on the aircraft? You? you could, yeah, you could do. Yeah, I can show you the exact one. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously, it means you're first in line for when they do the flights. Yeah, not yeah. So. yeah. Well, uh, look, yeah. favour will be upon you. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the rivet club at the moment is raising about five and a half thousand pounds a month. Gosh, so amazing. it's yeah, it's, it's helping. It, That's well, good, it's, yeah. it's not going to do the whole project, obviously, but uh, it all helps. It's That's a, a major yeah. step forward. Yeah. And how much? How much more do you need to raise to? The, well, the whole project is about three and a half million to do it, yeah. and we've probably spent about a million, million and a quarter so far. Yeah, yeah we've, got all, we've got five airworthy engines now. Um, the fins and rudders have been done, wingtips are being done. We've got a couple of elevators in there that yesterday were x rayed, NDT'd to yeah. see what the, the tubes, the torque tubes, like inside. Um, so then they'll be restored to airworthy. Yeah. Um, have you had the results of those? No? Have you... Not yet, no. No, they, they are physically shot on like when you go to hospital a proper yeah. film yeah. so they've got to be exposed um, so this winter was supposed to be the rear fuselage section so just behind the D you should look at it now backwards that was all going to come off and be restored but obviously <laughs> Covid's um, caused a problem for that so that will be next winter and do things like the, the gear work the, the undercarriage do you test the undercarriage uh, no we don't do undercarriage swings um, they've got jury struts in at the moment so like landed yeah. struts to, to keep the gear down so yeah uh, yeah, all the, obviously the engines work, the props, the variable pitch propellers, so we, we do that to uh, change the pitch on those when we're taxiing to uh, bring the oil around and flush it mm. through and stuff. So. That's awesome. What you're doing here is just incredible. Yeah, yeah, yeah it uh, really you. is. It's an absolute uh, tribute to everybody and to yourself. Mm, thank yeah. you very much. Yeah, thank you. I think it's a perfect place to stop it. Oh, that, nice. That is nice energy. In fact, that's almost an hour. <laughs> is it? That is absolutely yeah, brilliant. I, I apologise. So <laughs> no, no, no. no, no I, it's, it's, great. it's absolute gold. It really yeah. is. Yeah. And coming up on Future Pods, more from our trip to Lincolnshire, including a Dam Busters special recorded at their base at RAF Scampton, our visit to the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight and the Typhoons at RAF Coningsby. And our next podcast will feature Emma Breeley, who you've heard a little bit of. Uh, she's from the Petwood Hotel, which became the officer's mess for 617 Squadron during World War II, and which is full of memorabilia and remains a focal point for RAF reunions to this day. Emma spoke to us over a wonderful dinner at the Petwood, and, and because of that, it does <laughs> rather fall apart as the rest of us all became a bit emotional so so bear with us uh and poor old roy i think is still trying to edit it as we speak <laughs> in the meantime you can of course still listen to all our podcasts from series one and two you'll find us wherever you normally get your podcasts and please do get in touch with us on twitter facebook and instagram at top landing gear and do email us your questions for us james at info at that's info at 
two G's. And however you're listening to us, please recommend us to your friends and family and do leave a review, but only if you've enjoyed it. In the meantime, thanks for listening. <clears throat> yeah. And bye for now. Yeah.